My name is Elliot Chu, and I'm the Interim Dean of the College of Science at the University of Arizona. Today's lecture is called Water Beneath Our Feet. Our lecturer is Laura Condon, who came to the University of Arizona in 2018. Laura is an assistant professor in the Department of Hydrology and Atmospheric Science, and in 2020, Laura received a prestigious NSF Early Career Award. Laura's topic today is on groundwater, which is by far the largest unfrozen source of fresh water on Earth. And most people don't even realize this. Laura will introduce us to this valuable resource and discuss how this resource will help shape human society in the future. Hi, I'm Laura Condon, and today I'm gonna to be talking about how the water that we don't see shapes our world. So let's get oriented. This is the Earth, you are here. You probably all know that this is the blue planet. It's the blue planet because we have so much water. But what I'd like to point out in this picture is that most of the water that you're actually seeing here is not directly useful to us as humans. What you're seeing here uh, are the oceans, which are salty, clouds, which is water vapor, and snow and ice, which is frozen water. What we rely on is liquid fresh water. So I'd like to start with a question. Where do you think is the closest liquid fresh water to you right now? Did you just look down when I asked you that question? So this is a map of the global depth to groundwater. And there's a lot we could talk about in the spatial patterns of this map. But uh, what I really want you to notice at this point is the legend. What you can see here is that in general, groundwater is tens to maybe 100 meters deep. And what that means is that unless you're currently standing in view of a river or a stream, odds are that the closest liquid fresh water to you is actually under your feet. And we could take this one step further. Unless you're currently standing on an active volcano, in which case you should probably not be listening to this talk, if you start digging down, you will find water. Anywhere on the planet, if you dig down, eventually you'll find water. That's not to say that that water is gonna be easy to get to or that it's gonna be of the quality that you're looking for, but the point is that it's there. Just to put this in context, let's go back to the picture of the Earth that we started with. If we subtract off, all the water in the oceans, all the water vapor, all the frozen water, what we're left with is the liquid fresh water, that water that I talked about us depending on. Of this uh, liquid fresh water that's left, 99% of it is groundwater, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. 99% of our liquid fresh water on the planet is actually underground. If we could bring all of this up to the surface, it would be enough to cover all of the land surface of the planet with about 10 feet of water. So I mentioned this water is underground. We call this groundwater, but what does that even mean? There's a common misconception of groundwater as caves filled with water or underground rivers uh, that you could do things like scuba dive through like I'm showing here. And while it's true that we do have what are called karst systems that have large fractures that transmit flow, um, and these systems are prevalent in Florida and can be found actually all over the planet, most of what we actually are dealing with when we talk about uh, water in aquifers and groundwaters is much less photogenic. So uh, something like the picture I'm showing here. What you can think about is like watering a potted plant. When you water that plant, the water that doesn't flow out of the bottom is being held in the pore spaces of the soil. The same thing happens at a la landscape scale. When it rains, a lot of the water infiltrates. That's filling up the pores and the fractures underground, not just in the soil, but actually working its way much deeper. And what's really important, and we're going to circle back to this throughout the talk, is that this is a really slow process. This can happen over years, decades, even centuries. There's a lot more we could say at this point about the intricacies of hydrogeology and how groundwater works, but really there's just three things that I want you to note at this point. First of all, Note that groundwater is not underground rivers. It's water held in pore spaces and fractures underground. Second of all, it's huge. It's 99% of our unfrozen fresh water resource on the planet. And finally, it's everywhere. No matter where you are, if you dig down, you'll find water. So it's interesting then that given how huge and extensive this resource is, that it's something that a lot of people really don't know a lot about. And odds are you might not have answered groundwater when I asked you at the beginning where the closest freshwater was to you. We mentioned that groundwater is understandably hard to see and is easily overlooked, but I'd like to show you that we can actually see evidence of groundwater all over the place. And I'm gonna do that using three pictures. This is the first picture. 
And this is not a picture of groundwater. This is a picture of the Great Plains in the 1930s, what you might know of as the Dust Bowl. And there's a lot that we could talk about in terms of what led to this picture, but the really brief summary is that there were federal policies such as the Homestead Act that encouraged people to migrate in the late 19th and early 20th centuries by providing incentives with land for them to move. And as a result, there were millions of acres of grassland that were plowed up. What I'd like to point out is that there were federal policies providing land for people who were moving, but we didn't also have, this wasn't accompanied by additional federal, really large federal irrigation projects. For example, the Hoover Dam that was built on the Colorado River. The idea at the time was that rain would follow the plow. So if we just moved and started um, farming these areas, that it would all sort itself out. Of course it didn't though. Uh, this was fine as long as there was a lot of rain and there was a wet period in the late 1920s that made all of this okay. But when drought hit in 1931, crops quickly failed because there was no irrigation. This exposed bare soil and led to huge erosion problems. Over five years, tens of millions of acres of farmland lost their soil and became basically unusable. So this was a huge natural disaster. But if you think about the Great Plains today, you probably have a really different picture in your mind. If you've flown across the US, something like this picture I'm showing here is what you might think of when you think about the Great Plains. So what happened? Hint, it's not that we have more rainfall. There hasn't been a huge trend in rainfall across this part of the country over the last uh, 100 years. The answer is groundwater. This is a picture of a map of the Ogallala Aquifer, also known as the High Plains Aquifer. And this, is, this aquifer spans 175,000 square miles and crosses into more than eight states. It has roughly 3 billion acre feet of water in storage. And I just wanna pause there for a second because I'm gonna use the term acre feet multiple points in this talk. So an acre foot of water is the amount of water to cover one acre of land with one foot of water. And just to put that in context, it's enough water for, to support roughly a family of five for one year. Okay, so back to the story. The Ogallala Aquifer has 3 billion acre feet of water in it. And this water has been recharged over the course of hundreds and even thousands of years. So of course the Ogallala Aquifer was there before the Dust Bowl and we could have been using that water. But the key issue here is how we get the water out. Humans have been digging hand dug wells for thousands of years, but groundwater irrigation really only became possible in the 1930s and 40s as we got better drilling technology, better pumping technology, and better irrigation technology that allows us to use things like center pivots where we can sprinkle large areas of farmland supported by groundwater in a really seamless way. As a result of this improvement in technology today, Roughly one-sixth of the world's grain production is supplied by water from the Ogallala Aquifer. So I would say that if we look at a picture like this of grain production in the High Plains, this is really a picture of groundwater. And this is also true globally. This is just one example, but roughly 40% of all irrigated land is equipped for groundwater irrigation across the planet. Uh, as a result, groundwater is responsible for supplying roughly 13% of global food production. Here's another picture though. This is a picture of the city of Tucson, home to the University of Arizona, where we are today. On average, we get less than 12 inches of rainfall per year. And in some years, like this one, much less. So it should come as no surprise that the city of Tucson is located on the banks of the Santa Cruz River where we would have additional water supplies. This is really critical in dry climates such as ours. And actually, interestingly, the Santa Cruz River has the longest known history of cultivation in the US, more than 4,000 years. Really early on though, as this population of the city started to grow, they realized that they would need additional water supplies to help buffer out periods of no rainfall and droughts. So as early as 1882, the first well was drilled in the city of Tucson. And as the population grew, we started drilling more groundwater wells and increasingly relying on groundwater to support our population. So actually up until 1993, the city of Tucson was entirely reliant on groundwater. At the time, we were supporting more than 400,000 people with groundwater supplies alone. In 93, the Central Arizona Project brought Colorado River water to the city of Tucson. This is something that Connie talked about in her talk last week. But even with the Colorado River water, we still largely rely on groundwater to supply our needs.
In the US, about 145 million people get their drinking water from groundwater, which is just about half of our population. The same is true globally, about half the population across the world gets their drinking water from groundwater. Okay, so so far we've seen how groundwater is important for our human systems, our cities, um, as well as our food production. The last picture I wanna show you is this. This is the Colorado River near Moab, Utah. So why am I showing you this? Before I answer that, I wanna ask you another question. When it rains, how long do you think it takes for the water to get to the stream? So if you think about any time you've been outside near a water body when it's raining, how quickly do you see that water body responding to the rainfall? Likely, you would say that's gonna take minutes or hours, not days or weeks, right? But if that's the case, then why is the river still flowing days or weeks after it rains? There are rivers that dry up between rainfalls, but we have a lot of rivers that flow perennially, meaning they flow all the time. Where's that water coming from? So to answer this question, first I want you to imagine what would happen if the entire planet was paved, just one giant parking lot. If it rained, then we would see a picture like the one I'm showing you here, where we would see basically sheets of water flowing over the surface. If you think back to the last time you were outside when it rained though, this is really not what it looks like when it rains over a, land, a natural landscape. When it rains in a natural landscape, what we actually see are a variety of processes happening. So you might see some overland flow happening as that water makes its way through channels to a river, uh, but a lot of the rainfall is going to infiltrate into the subsurface. And that water is then gonna work its way underground, working its way vertically down, but then working its way laterally through the subsurface. And then it can reemerge from the subsurface to the stream. And this is what we call base flow. This is the groundwater contribution to our stream flow. And what's really important about this is that this can take days or even years to happen. And this is really, really important because it shows how groundwater acts as a, an important buffer to our systems. So what this means is that unlike the paved earth example I showed you, it's going to slow down the peak flow. Incidentally, this is also why we have things like retention basins and rain gardens in urban areas, because we wanna slow down that peak pulse of rainfall and flooding. But also it's going to provide additional water to the streams after the rainfall stops when we would have really low, low flows. So what the subsurface is doing here is decreasing the peak flows and increasing the baseline flows. So if we go back to this picture of the Colorado River, uh, what I'd like to point out is that although we're seeing surface water here, a lot of this surface water from the time the rain fell on the ground spent a significant part of its journey underground. In the case of the Upper Colorado River Basin, we estimate between 20 and 50% of this water originates as base flow. And this can be much more depending on the time of year we're in or how long, how dry of a season we're in. And it's more than just stream flow. So we talked about base flow being really important for our streams, but also you can think about the plants and the at the landscape scale, which rely on soil moisture. So the fact that infiltration is a much slower process than overland flow means that we have water that stays in the root zone in the pores of the soil much longer after it rains. Additionally, as that water infiltrates down and then moves laterally in the subsurface, we can have shallow water tables, which can give plants really consistent access to water in between rainfalls. So you can think about things like riparian zones around rivers, uh, which have shallow water tables and you have plants that have pretty constant access to the water that they need. Okay, so at this point now, I've shown you three pictures. We've seen how groundwater supports agriculture, how it supports urban areas, and how it's even supporting our landscapes. And this really is to illustrate how important this system is to our world as a whole. I said though that I would not just talk about how groundwater has shaped our world today, but also why it's important for the future. And in order to do that, we need to take a step back and look at not just what groundwater is doing to the world around us, but how we as humans are reshaping groundwater. This is a picture of groundwater storage losses that occurred in the recent California drought. And there's a couple things that are remarkable about this picture, but the first thing I wanna note is that this picture is actually essentially taken from space. And that might seem a little counterintuitive to you. I said at the beginning that we definitely can't see groundwater from space. We can barely even see it when we're right on top of it. Uh, but actually, if we know what we're looking for, we can see changes in groundwater storage. 
This is a picture of what the Earth looks like to us, to our visible eye. But this next picture is a picture of what the Earth looks like to a pair of satellites called GRACE that are mapping the Earth's gravity field. And the first thing you can notice from this is that it's not constant. So we have different distributions of mass across the planet that result in spatial variability in Earth's gravity field. So this is of course really interesting if you do this once, but what's really important for what we're gonna talk about is what happens when you do this more than once. So if we make maps of Earth's gravity field over time, and then we subtract, what we're actually seeing is changes in mass across the planet over time. And the heaviest thing that's changing over time is water. So if we go back to the picture I showed you of storage losses from California's drought, what you're really seeing in this picture is groundwater pumping in the Central Valley. So as we have a drought and there's less precip and surface water available, if we're not gonna have large crop failures, what happens is farmers turn to groundwater and we pump additional water from storage in order to meet that water demand. So this is a map of the storage losses as a result of that. So I started with these pictures from Grace because I think they're really cool and dramatic and they can show you the really large scale impacts that we have on groundwater. But the truth is we don't have to go to space to see these impacts. We can see impacts to groundwater storage uh, over long periods just using all the wells that we've drilled, looking at the water levels um, and water level declines across the world. So before we get into that in too much detail though, I wanna back up and talk about what actually happens when we pump groundwater because it's really important to understand that there's several key differences between groundwater pumping and surface water diversions. So what you can see in this figure here is called a cone of depression. When we pump groundwater, we see large declines nearest the well, but those declines then radiate outwards in every direction. So think about like drinking a milkshake from a straw. And what's important about this is this means that people that are upstream or far away from you can be impacted due to the pumping that's happening at your well. This is really different than say a stream flow diversion where no one upstream is gonna be inf impacted by the water you divert at one location. So in this regard, it's really important that we think about our aquifers as communal resources. As we're all pumping, if we draw down the water table, we'll be drawing it down for everyone. This is also really important if we think about groundwater recovery. So if you stop diverting water from the stream, it will recover pretty much right away. However, if you stop pumping groundwater, those water levels are gonna stay low because of the storage you've removed. And the rate at which the groundwater levels are going to recover is depending on the amount of recharge coming into the system. And what's important about that is that recharge is really hard to predict. We have to know how much it's raining, how much of that rainfall is gonna be used by plants and how much of it is actually gonna infiltrate deeper down into the groundwater. We also have multiple timescales to think about as it takes time for water to work its way down to the groundwater and for lateral groundwater to move laterally within the subsurface. The point here is that recharge is difficult to measure and groundwater recovery is also difficult to predict. So I guess it should probably come as no surprise that ground, unsustainable groundwater use is pretty common. Let's go back to our map of the High Plains. Remember this is supporting one sixth of the world's grain production. This map here shows water level declines since the 1950s based on observations in groundwater wells. What you can see from this map are uh, large scale declines across really large areas. Overall, we've lost about 300 million acre feet from the High Plains Aquifer. And Something I'd like to highlight here is that these losses are not evenly distributed. So in places like Northwest Texas and West Kansas, there've been some really severe impacts where we've had water levels decline more than 100 feet. And this can actually lead to wells going dry and groundwater being really unusable or inaccessible. And this, the same story we can see across major aquifers in the US and also globally. Across the US, we've lost around 800 million acre feet or 1,000 cubic kilometers from storage since about 1900. 
And here I'm talking about depletions that are occurring in excess of recharge. So this is the long-term storage that has been lost, that is not being recovered. And this is a really big problem, of course, for water supply. We worry about having enough water in our aquifers that we'll be able to use it when we need it. But I'd also like to put, point out that we can have additional impacts uh, that occur way before we start worrying about running out of water. And to think about that, we need to go back and remember the importance of base flow and that connection of water that infiltrates when it rains, moves laterally underground, and then can reemerge at our streams, like the example I showed in the Colorado River. So as we're pumping groundwater and drawing down those water levels, that can influence the connection between groundwater and streams. So that means we can be decreasing base flow or we can actually switch streams so that they're not gaining water from the groundwater, they're actually losing water to the groundwater. And this can have a big impact on our stream flows. So for example, in the High Plains, there's been a large loss of small tributaries that's been documented over the last century. Uh, similarly, if we look at the city of Tucson, I mentioned that Tucson was built on the banks of the Santa Cruz River, but actually by the 1970s, they said that the river had died through the city. It was really dry all the time, except during storm events. And what's interesting here is that this isn't because of surface water diversions. The city had already switched to using pretty much exclusively groundwater at this point. What happened though was because of groundwater pumping, there were regional declines in the water levels, and this led to decreased base flow to the river and eventually the river drying up. And the point here is that we don't have to be running out of water in our aquifer for this to happen. We just need the water levels to drop enough to influence the groundwater stream flow connection. At this point, we've laid out how important groundwater is to both our natural and human systems, and then also how much we as humans can shape these systems. And I wanna pause here and really point out the complexity of these interactions. We mentioned recharge being hard. Recharge is complicated because we have to consider the rate of precipitation that occurs. That's gonna determine how much has enough time to infiltrate into the subsurface. But also we have to think about how much water is gonna be taken up by plants. Additionally, we talked about stream flow and the sensitivity of stream flow to groundwater levels and the importance of groundwater flow if we want to be able to predict what our stream flows will be during dry periods. And then finally, we talked about how important human actions are because human pumping and irrigation can change all of these interactions. So it should come as no surprise, given all of these complexities, that groundwater remains a kind of misunderstood part of many of our systems. To address this, what we really need are computer models that can help us understand all of these interactions. We need observations too, but it's hard to really difficult to measure all of the different interactions that I just mentioned coming into play. My research group at the University of Arizona develops advanced numerical models where we can model watershed systems, really large watershed systems, from the bedrock all the way up to the treetops and in some cases up to the atmosphere. And what's key about these approaches is that we try not to make assumptions about how our watersheds behave. So for example, we try not to assume if this much rain, rain falls, then this much will end up in the river. Or if we have this much stream flow, this much of it will be composed from base flow from groundwater. To do this, we solve the physics of how water and energy move across a landscape. So we take real systems and then we make numerical models of them by dividing them up into grid blocks where we can solve the equations of motion that I talked about. In my research group, we do this at a national scale. So we build models that require millions of grid cells and very large data sets and very computationally intensive problems. But what's cool about this approach is that when we can do this over large spatial scales, we can start to use numerical models as windows to improve our understanding of both how our systems have behaved in the past and how they will behave in the future. So I'd like to go back to the story of stream flow depletions that we've talked about so far. I talked about documented uh, tributary declines over the High Plains Aquifer, as well as, as well as the loss of the Santa Cruz River in Tucson. And we have lots of examples of this across the country and across the world, especially in really heavily developed groundwater locations. But what we wanted to understand is how this actually plays out across the country, not just thinking about really heavily developed locations. And and this is a big challenge to do with observations because a lot of times we don't have observations going back for the period of record we need. 
And additionally, at the same time that we've been pumping and using groundwater, we've been changing how we irrigate crops. There's been urbanization, there's been surface water withdrawals, there's been a myriad of other changes. So it's really hard to disentangle all those changes just from the impact that groundwater changes have. And this is really the big advantage of numerical models because we can start to use them to isolate the, um, the connections that we're interested in. This is a map of simulated stream flow impacts based on roughly 1,000 cubic kilometers or 800 million acre feet of water that have been lost from groundwater storage since roughly the 1900s. So what we do in this simulation is we don't let anything else change. We just take out the groundwater storage and we see the isolated impact of just that change on our watersheds alone. And what you can see here with the orange and the red lines is that we have really significant losses across the Western US, especially in small tributaries. For example, those small tributaries I talked about um, completely disappearing in the High Plains aquifer. And so this is consistent with what we've seen observationally. But what I wanna show you is that with the model, we can see how widespread these impacts really are. Even in places where we haven't had really dramatic groundwater declines, as we're pumping and removing water from storage, once we start losing that shallow groundwater storage, we very quickly have connections and impacts to stream flow. And so this really highlights the fact that we don't have to be running out of water to be having an impact on groundwater surface water interactions. So this is one example of how we can use models to understand the past, but we really want to think about what's going to be happening in the future. Climate projections indicate that we'll have shifts in precipitation intensity as well as shifts in temperature. And a big question is how will our watersheds respond to this cha these changes and what role does groundwater have to play in these systems? But of course, these are really complicated and interconnected systems. So we have to think about a lot of changes at the same time if we're going to understand them. We can already see this playing out. For example, this headline in the Colorado about the Colorado River. The warming climate is intensifying drought, contributing to fires, and drying out the river's headwaters, sending consequences cascading downstream. This is something that Connie touched on in her talk last week. We know that the Colorado River is currently experiencing a very severe drought out. But also if we look back at trends over the last century, we estimate that stream flow has declined around 11%. And what's interesting about this is that there hasn't been an 11% decrease in precipitation over the same time period. What there has been a trend in is temperature. So what's been happening is as the basin warms, plants are using more water, and this is changing how much water actually gets to the river. So we can have the same amount of precipitation, but depending Depending on what happens with plant water use, infiltration, and groundwater flow, the amount of water that we see in the river will change. And this is really a widespread issue as we've been seeing warming occur across the country. The 100th meridian is basically the divide between the Great Plains and the Eastern US. And historically, it's been the place where precipitation is balanced by plant water usage. So to the west of the 100th meridian, we think of uh, more arid, where plant water use is limited by the amount of precipitation that is um, coming in, versus in the eastern US, to the east of that divide, we have more precipitation than plants can use. Over the last century, this dividing line has moved about 100 miles east, basically increasing the arid portion of our country. And the question is, how is this going to change going forward? How fast is this going to move if we have continued warming trends and changes in precipitation? And what role does groundwater have to play in those changes? So again, to answer these questions, we often rely on computer models here because we're looking to the future, so we can't use our observations to guide what's gonna happen. This is a map of groundwater storage losses from our model simulation under a warming scenario. So what's happening here is as we warm up the temperature in our model, plants are using more water, that's taking water out of storage, and we're also decreasing the recharge that would make it down to groundwater. And so this is a demonstration of what we'd expect to see happen as we have warmer temperatures, we decrease groundwater storage. 
We can also look at these trends over time in our model. So the black line here is the baseline oscillation that occurs in groundwater storage annually without any warming happening. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the really important things about groundwater is that it's much slower moving than the rest of our system. So groundwater storage tends to increase during the wet portions of the year and then decrease during the dry portions of the year as plants are pulling more water out of storage and we have more discharge from groundwater to streams during low flow and dry periods. So we see this natural oscillation in our system regardless. When we have warming though, what we see is storage declines that happen and storage declines that especially happen during the dry portion of the year when groundwater is most important for providing supplemental water supplies for the system. And so on the one hand, we could think about this from the groundwater storage perspective, which is what I've been doing so far, talking about the fact that when we have warming, we're gonna have groundwater storage losses, but also we could flip this on its head and think a little bit about these storage losses as really buffering our system. So if we didn't have those storage losses, when we had increased temperature, the plants would not have additional water access uh, to access, nor would we have base flow discharging to our streams. So as a result, we would have less stream flow and we would have plants that are more stressed. So really what we're seeing when we see these dips in groundwater storage is you're seeing an example of groundwater buffering what would otherwise be water stress in our watershed systems. The problem here though, is that we're not seeing a rebound in the groundwater storage because we're consistently warming and drying the system. So once the storage is gone, it's gone. So if we go back to the example I showed you of the 100th meridian moving its way eastward across the US and expanding this arid portion of the country. What the model results I just showed you illustrate is that as this warming occurs, shallow groundwater storage can actually buffer the rate at which we see our systems drying out because it can be providing surplus water under a hotter scenario. So the rate of this aridity shift is partially controlled by the shallow groundwater storage. And we can see this in our simulations too. So this graph shows the change in plant water usage per degree of warming. And each of the lines here are a major watershed in the US. And the more humid basins are blue and the more arid basins are red. And what you see here is that these blue lines are at the top of the graph and they have the steepest lines indicating that they have the largest changes in plant water usage and evaporation as we have warming. And as we move, so these are Eastern, more humid basins. And as you move down the graph, you see less sensitive response in the drier Western basins. So what this indicates is that in the parts of the country where we do have shallow groundwater and we start to have warming, groundwater can have a really important buffering effect on the system. But in places that have already dried out or where groundwater is really deep, we've already lost that buffer to our system. So far, I've just talked about this from a natural systems perspective. All we did in our model was increase the temperature and we can see these storage losses. This can be even more dramatic though if we start to consider human behaviors. So for example, the picture I showed you earlier of the storage losses in the California drought. This occurs because we start pumping more groundwater when our surface water supplies are limited. So we can see that actually in these scenarios, if we started to include human water demand, we might see even more dramatic impacts to groundwater in a warming future. So really the take home message here is that we need to be thinking about groundwater as we're thinking about the behavior of our watersheds as a whole in the future. So this might seem like a lot of bad news and it's true that there are a lot of challenges facing us with respect to global water security in the future. But I'd like to end on a theme of hope because I think groundwater has a lot of unique properties that make it really important for our sustainable future. It's been critically important in bringing us to where we are today and will be even more so in the future. So I'd like to provide a couple of examples of groundwater recovery and possibilities for the future. And here, Arizona has some great examples that we can look at. This is a map of groundwater level changes since 2000 in the city of Tucson, in the Tucson Basin. And what you see here in the green and purple are areas where we've had increasing groundwater storage over time. 
This happened because Arizona implemented active management areas in the 1980s. And the goal of the active management areas was to ensure that by 2025, all of our groundwater pumping would be fully balanced by recharge. So we wouldn't have any long-term declines occurring. And what you can see is as a result of this policy, we have seen within our active management areas, groundwater levels recovering. Similarly, I talked about the Santa Cruz River and the fact that the river died in the 70s, but there have actually been efforts to rejuvenate the river through the city of Tucson. So for example, there's been a recent project to increase effluent releases to the river and develop and um, help support parts of the river that can be flowing year round through the city of Tucson. This of course has led to increased stream flow, but also increased recharge to the groundwater, which is good for our groundwater systems. So the point I'd like to highlight with these examples, these are just a couple of examples of groundwater recovery, I could show you many more, is that unchecked, we might have problems with unsustainable use, but there is really great potential to actively manage our systems and to support both groundwater and surface water systems. We can think not just about actively managing our groundwater pumping and withdrawals, but also about actively managing our, re our recharge because pore space is actually another storage opportunity. Actively managed recharge is the process of intentionally increasing groundwater recharge, either through pumping uh, directly into the groundwater system or increasing recharge through things like recharge basins or even with the effluent project that I showed you for the Santa Cruz River. And what's important about these projects is they allow us to store water without building additional dams. And we also don't have to worry about evaporative losses from the surface because it's stored underground. Arizona has a large history of groundwater recharge. We've been banking a large portion of the water we get from the Colorado River through the Central Arizona Project in recharge facilities for years. We've already uh, banked more than 3.6 million acre feet of Colorado River water, which is about two years of our total annual delivery. And many other locations are, are doing this too and are starting to do this more and more. For example, in California, they've started some projects where they divert floodwaters that would otherwise be going to the ocean onto orchards to try to improve and increase the amount of recharge that occurs in large stream flow events. Again, these are just a few examples. Uh, what I'd like to highlight though, is that there are a lot of challenges ahead, but also a lot of opportunity and that we really can't afford to overlook groundwater when we're thinking about these solutions. As researchers, we're working to push our understanding of how watersheds might evolve and change in the future. But in addition to this, we also need improved monitoring, sophisticated models, and policies that are gonna allow us to best take advantage of the information that we have available to us. And if you listen to Kevin's talk next week, he's gonna be talking about some of these aspects as relates to water and society. So really, I'd like to just leave you with a couple of take home messages. First of all, I hope you now appreciate that groundwater is not an isolated bucket or a prehistoric river, but it's a really huge and integral part of our systems. And how we use it matters a lot, both if you wanna understand how we got to where we are today, but also if you wanna understand our future sustainability. And I hope that from listening to this talk, you have an improved appreciation from the, of this system and that from time to time, you'll pause and think about this amazing resource that's actually just right under your feet. Thank you for joining us for the fourth lecture in our series on water. We hope you can join us next week for our fifth and final lecture, Water, Society and a Changing Climate with Kevin Anchikaitis. Our society's most significant challenges from climate change will be those involving water both too much causing flooding and too little causing droughts. Next week, we will explore what lessons from past civilizations can tell us about the dangers we face and how we might adapt. In his talk, Kevin Anchikaitis will take us on a tour around the globe to explore how climate change alters the planet's water cycle, how societies past and present have responded, and the challenges we face in the future. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, Tucson Electric Power and our series sponsors Cost Communications, Halua Low Companies, Retheon Missiles and Defense, Research Corporation for Science Advancement, Tucson Medical Center, and Visit Tucson. Your generous support is what makes this series possible.